Hey guys, I'm Gaspatian. You've seen me launching rockets, it's only going to get worse from here. Last time we had issues, and lots of them. Most of them were related to the solid rocket boosters that our space program still is rather dependent upon. So we wowed to do something about that right quick. We spend the science from our first orbital recovery right away. We're looking to unlock stability, which will give us air brakes as well as a new Rattler pulse jet engine. Then, to progress in the tech tree and make some sweet money on the side, we get off our high horse and take contracts that may normally be beneath our glorious space program, but will serve us well in the long run. In particular, we're looking for the stock targeted survey contracts for the money and the field research contracts around the KSE for the science. To get the latter of these two contract types done, we're finally doing the sensible thing we talked about doing back in episode 2, which is to build a rover. We're going to keep the design simple for now, but it will act as a testbed and perform valuable calibrations of our science experiments in preparation of sending probes to other celestial bodies. We are still quite far away from successfully landing something on anything else but Kerbin for now, but when that day comes, our engineer's argument will not hurt to be well prepared. We're going to leave it up to pass me to teach you how to drive a rover. So we got the seismic scan, we want to transmit that because we're going to run other seismic scans. We had a Mr. U observation to do here as well, even though we have already done that experiment. So, um, all right, and here are some other interesting quirks about the launch pad. It's not, the collision mesh is not at all what you think it is. So for instance, I can't go over there can't go over there. Another reason to maybe not scale the wheels down as much as I did. But let's see if we can wiggle our way out of here with enough. enough speed. Yeah, you can see exactly how high the, this edge actually is. So, um, yeah. Let's try the other way. I don't know. No, let's just recover this. So again, our great plans are foiled by invisible walls and obstacles. Luckily, we have options when it comes to deploying these probes, so we'll head over to the runway with it and head out from there. Of course, if you don't drive with great care, you'll have to try and try again. Which arguably is something I'm provably good at doing. Voluntarily so, even. Yeah. I wish there was anything really interesting to say here, but it's just a very standard drive to all the waypoints mission as seen in any number of games, really. So the idea here is the same as with the manned rover we drove around with earlier, which is com to complete the contract. Ask Capcom if, you have, if we have any viable new contracts in the same flavor and go about and finish those in the same go. You could see that we had to ram the astronaut complex just like before to get that contract parameter fulfilled. Other than that, the rover excursions are from now pretty uneventful thanks to careful driving and a lot of patience. If pressed for time, this is not something I'd recommend that you do, but the completionist in me simply cannot let all of this wonderful science be left uncollected. But yeah, I can totally see how even with lots of post-processing magic, this looks like a dull process and your eyes only partially deceive you in that. Anyways, 
We managed to fulfill the contract parameters given to us by Mission Control, who by this time must be amazed at our perseverance. In any case, they've stopped offering us these contracts and urged us to go ahead and try something else. Which I guess is a fair... a fair request by now. Contracts? What are they offering us? They are offering us the powered landing here. And this is part of uh, the progression contract and it has this, um, this requirement to not have a Mark 16 parachute or Mark 2 radial mount parachute nor have anything from the cat category arrow on the vessel as you do this. And this is the contract that broke for me once because I had to delete these components from, uh, from the ga game install. Why would you delete a stock part from the game just to save a little RAM past me? Anyways, past me then goes on about how to fix the issue in the contract pack, but doesn't actually submit a patch to Yemo, because past me is a cheeky bastard. While our engineers are putting that craft together, we're having the same issue as before, where our renegade pilot has stolen away in one of our planes. We'll mind him later and get right on with testing this lander. So we're just going to design something really basic here to fulfill the contract with no actual similarity to any of our future landers. Why four-way symmetry on the boosters you ask? No idea. Basically with the parts we have available there are only so many inventive designs you can go with. We need to use these hybrid rocket boosters because they are, they are our only throttleable engines with gimbaling and gimbaling is the only way we can steer at the moment without fins. So we're just going to launch this horrid abomination as is. And this flight is going to look much like our other flights in that it's not going to reach space. I mean, not that it's meant to go to space, we just wanted to hit the altitude specified by the contract and then come down somewhat gently. I think that's what's going on, it's kind of hard to see because of the plume on these procedural boosters, which does not scale with the size of the booster. Uh, we'll try to judge our speed based on the speed of the smoke cloud we're looking at and try to bring down th that down to zero before landing. Of course, since we're using these struts as landing legs, we don't have to be picky because they have a ridiculous crash tolerance. So us being careful here is all about style points, but sometimes style points are as good as having actual science points, right? But it's science we're here for first and foremost, and the science we've gathered thus far is going to carry us further and faster than we've ever gone before. After a while, that is. While we wait for time to pass, we eye the only contract that Mission Control seems to be willing to offer. Which is to head out to the MUN. We could probably pull something like that off right now, but relying on solid rocket boosters hasn't done much good for us thus far. So we're instead going to get that done at another time and for now focus on an improved plane. This plane will utilize the pulse jets added by Venstock revamp and unlocked with the stability tech node, which also gave us air brakes. While this plane will, using these engines, be able to pick up some serious speed, the biggest improvement for our program is the addition of air brakes, which allow us to perform precision landings more easily than ever before. So this whole process of designing a plane from start to finish can take quite a while in Kerbal Space Program, and doubly so with procedural wings. Ferrum Aerospace does add to the complexity of designing something that will fly, but as long as you stick to designs that have at some point flown in real life, you're often going to find decent values for your stability derivatives from the get-go. Which is to say, you can design and fly something crazy looking in the Ferrum Aerospace as well, but be prepared to fiddle about with it for a couple of hours. We're going to make something that sort of looks like a Messerschmitt 262, but with the pulse jets mounted on the tail section rather than under the wings. Small deviations from history is something Ferrum will overlook on a good day at least. But numbers are one thing. Actual flight data from the simulator is another. We're of course not putting any Kerbals in real danger before properly testing these designs in the simulator. 
that would be too cruel. So after a few near misses and some properly not so much misses, we judge that the design is ready for its first real flight. I like the sounds of pulse jets in the morning. But again, look at the differences air brakes make in Ferrum Aerospace. In stock, slowing down in a plane is really never an issue. You flare and all your speed magically vanishes. Which sometimes is what you want and at other times is the last thing you'll need. Flaring in Ferrum Aerospace only bleeds a fraction of your airspeed. Which is good, since it lets you perform maneuvers without losing all your airspeed. But it is way more likely to rip your airplane to shreds and does a poor job at getting you down to your desired landing velocity if you're coming in too hot. Of course, since you've got a greater glide performance through maneuvers, it's easier to come around for a second try with Ferrum installed, but we've already seen how mission time racks up if you can't quite nail a landing. The footage speaks for itself though, with the survey contracts being completed in short order over a couple of flights in our new jet, dubbed the Pulsar. It has earned us plenty of buffer money for, and some token science and reputation to keep us progressing. It's also quite apparent that this plane is just a bundle of joy in the air. While I will not attempt acrobatics such as those shown in the test flight reel on a real mission, it's still evident that this craft is plenty maneuverable and a veritable speed demon compared to our basic glider. You can see why we're again daring to feel optimistic about the future of this space program after the repeated mishaps of last episode. Before closing this introduction chapter of the series, where we've looked at the early days and mishaps of the Gaspachian Space Administration, Beginning with unmanned suborbital and barely orbital flights in conjunction with some early av aviation to pass the time, I'd like to bring in a highlight segment to tell you of things to come. We're obviously not playing the game with only stock parts, so I'll try to explain some of what IDs are cooking up in our jet propulsion laboratory. The most obvious feature is that we're doing most things using procedural parts. This includes wings, tanks, solid boosters, and fairings. Now I'll ask you to tell me exactly where in the tech tree each of these respectively unlock new scythe limits and what those limits are, with the mods themselves, set to rebalance, and 64k installed simultaneously. Also, which nodes do you need to make sure stay unhidden when running the hide empty tech nodes mod in conjunction with community tech tree? You don't know that offhand, and neither do I. So instead of trying to make sense of all of that, I changed, I changed the configs, as I always do with this series. All the procedural parts that have size limits based on tech are now tied to the rocketry branch, going this way in the tech tree. And uh, as such, we'll never have to deal with uh, some unfortunate scenarios that may otherwise occur, like well, you just unlocked your 5-meter fuel tanks. 
but you're stuck with 3 meter interstage fairing, so you can't really use those fuel tanks for anything. Because uh, you can't fit an interstage fairing on top of it, and then, then what's the point? Now, fuel does not do us any good if we don't have engine to funnel it into. So uh, it's not going to be enough to unlock these uh, different rocket diameter upgrades, as, as they are called. Uh, instead, we'll, we'll need to fit engines on these fuel tanks. And the question is always, when you start modding Kerbal Space Program, which engines are you going to be using? So far, we have been relying on stock engines, as well as some engines added in by Venn, apart from our procedural boosters, of course. For memory purposes, I've stripped some engines from both packs, both stock and Venn stock revamp such as the overheating low-tech uh, liquid fuel boost booster and some upper stage engines with shoddy perf performance brought in by Venn. I argue that even if an engine should be in the install, it should be viable even in later stages of the game, rather than having a direct upgrade a techno or two above it. Uh, that would mean that we would never ever consider it using it again after we'd unlock the quote-unquote better engine. That's just those two packs. We also bring in a quite a bit of other packs as well into the game. Uh, for their improved specific impulse and with thrust suited to sustainer stages or upper stages, we bring in Nerti's cryo engines. These are unlocked at later stages in the tech tree, starting at improved rocketry here with a vacuum engine of, uh, of a smaller dimension. Uh, there are several others following this uh, rocketry branch that we shall not look at directly, but uh, know that they are there and will be unlocked during the series. Their slightly better performance will be critical as our payloads keep on growing through this series, and bigger no loads will need to be put into LKO for cheaper because we are indeed playing in career mode. Also, let us pretend that we care about the exhaust from these engines being more environmentally fr friendly, even though no such thing is modeled in-game. So, other than that, uh, later on in the tech tree we'll, we're looking at more exotic modes of propulsion than our old boring chemical rockets. Venn adds a larger scale Nerva-like nuclear engine in the form of the Nova. Uh, while we look to Nuclear Age to give us smaller options as well as other big options. Uh, for instance, this lantern I believe is pulled in from there, and this nuclear light bulb, but also smaller versions such as the candle ra radioisotope rocket, which may or may not be quite realistic, but it's n still nice to have uh, in here. But sometimes, nuclear isn't slow enough for our tastes. We then look to near-future propulsion for all of our low-thrust, insane specific impulse needs. This pack brings in an incredible amount of engines by default, mostly in trios of varying scales and efficiencies. I've opted to strip the pack down to size mostly by removing the intermediate options for the different engine classes, because I figure either you go big or you go small, but rarely you'd stick right in the middle. This leaves us with a couple of Argon Ion engines, a few new Xenon engines, as well as the mighty Magneto Plasma Thruster and the variable specific impulse Magneto Plasma Rockets, or the Vasimirs for short, right up here in the end of that node. These are very late in the tech tree, as you can see, but if ever unlocked, uh, will allow us to build efficient cycler ships for crewed missions to other planets, not unlike the Hermes of recent successful sci-fi movie fame. But for when we want to break free of Kerbin's prohibitive atmosphere, we're going to utilize proven technology. The epitome of proven tech is included in the install in the form of the F1 Kerolox engine. The scale remains faithful to its real-life counterpart, however the stats and fuel requirements are scaled to work a bit better in conjunction with stock parts. The modeling and texturing on this engine is 
absolutely exquisite, which is reason enough to use it, even if it wasn't the most powerful atmospheric e engine that we have in our arsenal. So with that, I think I will leave you for now. This has been the first chapter in our space exploration series in 64K. Next time we'll start doing some actual space stuff, which I am fully aware was lacking in this episode. And I'll see you guys then.